Sunday, 7 a.m. And we have a baptism coming up, and that's going to be March 20th. So that's going to be pretty cool. I have three people that are signed up for baptism. Just want to encourage you that we do, do give a moment for you to say a few words about your experience and your coming to Christ and your journey. Um, you know, we want it to be as memorial as possible, memorable. So that's coming up. And uh, I was asked about this, so I'm just going to kind of cover it briefly. And I did actually last Sunday. And I think the reason why I want to cover it even more is, you know, when we hear about things in the news about people suffering, we definitely want to be praying for them. We believe in the power of prayer. Um, you know, the Russian incursion into Ukraine. Uh, I know for, for our church, whenever something like this happens, whether it's floods in the Midwest or earthquake uh, or something like this, we donate as a church. So I just want you to know that. Uh, we were just waiting for some of the dust to settle to see some of these groups get on the ground there to be able to help these people. Uh, so I think now I feel very confident in spe specifically one organization that could help. If you have anything that you know of, an organization, I'd be more than happy to take suggestions. But the question people are asking for students of the Bible, is this the Ezekiel 38 and 39 battle? And I would say no because there's a confederation of nations that are actually going to move south, not west. And I would say, though, that this is a precursor. So this is a precursor to uh, these world powers flexing their muscles. This happened a lot in, just before World War I. And there was one assassination that plunged the whole, you know, right? You, you know, a lot of you students of history pl plunged so many countries into, they were almost itching to get into a fight. And then, of course, World War II happened after that. So I would say that this is the birth pangs that Jesus speaks about. Now, with birth pangs, there's usually a pause and some relief, and then it happens again. The frequency and intensity increases, so Jesus was using a metaphor for world events. Um, so uh, lately, in the last several years, a lot, of, a lot has happened, and it seems like the pangs are coming closer together and more intense. Um, but that's good news in, in the grand scheme of things because we know that the Lord is, he's said he'd usher in his kingdom. Um, interesting little uh, maybe sort of discussion. If you look at, uh, put the map up, and I covered this Revelation 16 through 19, 16, 17, 18, 19, heavily. I covered this in Ezekiel 38 and 39. There are things in the Bible, when I became a Christian, I started reading, I thought I was a student of history, and I'm like, wow, how come I never knew that this was in here? So this is here. I mean, world leaders can look at it if they like, and they would learn a lot more about geopolitics. And this, these things happened, these discussions happened that the Lord uh, shared with us long before these were even countries. So if you look at Russia over here and Ukraine over here, China's over here, and Iran is over here, and this is extremely important because this is a counterbalance to the West. There's something called the Asian Cooperative Dialogue. It's only been around for about 20 years. And basically, Russia, China, and Iran are heading that. Now, you might think that China's, China likes to play, play around, and they have some, some aspirations economically and militarily. If you think President Xi Jinping is saying to Putin, knock it off, he's funding them back, back door, OK? Um, if you look at Russia, Russia is a land and air bridge to Europe, and China admittedly wants to be the largest exporter of goods. Unfortunately for the world, China uses slaves to make those goods, and we buy those goods. Personally, if it was me, I'll spend the extra money to, for that product to be made somewhere else. So Xi Jinping over here, the president, is quietly okay with what's going on because it's also taking the uh, spotlight off of him and how he treats the Uyghur Muslims. Um, so there's a lot here, and I mean, all this stuff was predicted when I covered Revelation 16. Uh, big, big, when you, if, if you weren't here, you can get it for free off the website. I said a lot of these things before it happened, but it doesn't make me smart. I'm just going with what the Bible says, and I hate to say it, but the USA in end times prophecy really becomes irrelevant, and there could be a lot of reasons for that. So the world is, is going to go through a difficult time. I believe we're going to go through a difficult time, and um, you know, but we have to give that message of hope about the Lord's coming kingdom to the world. So people think, oh, you know, Christianity is a fairy tale. You guys believe this and that. However, there are facts 
that were written long before these nations were established, when you read it, the hair on the back of your neck will stand up because you say, how did anybody know this? It's all predicted. So we're going to jump in at this point. The teens will stay in service this morning. Uh, we're going to be in Luke 4. This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And the last time the message was titled Christ's Inaugural Baptism. And honestly, <laughs> I was like, I might as well just really go with this one because you saw something that happened in the first century, John's baptism, Jesus' baptism, and then we get to really what we're familiar with for the last two millennia, which is uh, when Christians come to, when people come to the Lord and they get baptized. So there's just anything you ever wanted to know about baptism, I kind of packed into that message. And actually, we're going to have a baptism uh, in a few Sundays from now, which is pretty neat. Uh, today, the message is titled, The Temptation of Christ. And we're going to look in the, at this in two sermons. This is going to be the first sermon. We're going to cover the first two temptations. And then next Sunday, we're going to kind of finish it out. Uh, we're going to look at this in three parts. And what's very important is we're going to ask some questions. Number one is, you know, why, did, why is this even in the Bible? What's this all about? What are the meanings behind it? Uh, what were the temptations to Jesus? And what did they mean? What are the temptations to us? And what do they mean? And also, how does that fit into 1 John 2, where we talk about uh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life? So we're going to kind of bring everything together in one sermon. Uh, and very excited to do it because it's just a really great portion of Scripture. So starting with verse 1, it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, right, where John was, activity going on there, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted or tested for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are, now this can be translated in the Greek, since you are. The devil knew who he, who he was dealing with. He was dealing with God the Son. So, since you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. You're hungry, Jesus. You know, it's nothing wrong with taking care of your needs. And that's my kind of paraphrase there. But Jesus answered saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. When we go into this one next Sunday, this is really pretty wild when we start to look at the background here. And said to him, since you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Jump off that pinnacle. Uh, I think the Kidron Valley is there in, in a corner, and that would have been a, a fall of well over 100 feet. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Sort of like with the eagles that throw the eaglets out of the nest, and they try to get them to fly, and then the eagle comes and scoops them up. So it's kind of the picture in my mind how Satan is saying, and we'll, we'll talk about why he wanted him to do that. There's a meaning behind that. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, you shall not tempt or test the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So one out of three is, what's the purpose of this? Well, we just came off of the baptism, right? Uh, Jesus was identifying with us, with sinners, through the process of baptism. We went into that uh, extensively. Here he identifies with sinners in temptation. And 
I you know, I'm studying this message and all these cliches keep popping into my mind. So we'll talk about some of the cliches, whether they're real or whether they're not real. But you've heard of the expression, you know, walk a mile in a person's shoes. Well, Jesus walked the earth in our shoes. He, God the Son came in the form of, you know, divinity in humanity and he showed us the way. And if he hadn't, we'd, for 2,000 years, we'd be lost. Oh, Jesus came, he left, he died. What am I supposed to do now? But he shows us the way. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews 4, great portion of Scripture, starting with verse 14, it says, Seeing that we have a great high priest, Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, the whole high priest idea is basically that the priest would offer a sacrifice uh, for the people uh, to God and Jesus as this sort of symbolic but then also literal high priest. Uh, Jesus did offer the sacrifice, and he had these two roles. As the priest, he offered the sacrifice, but he also was the sacrifice, right? Here comes, John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He sacrificed himself so that we could have eternal life. So my question is, then why did the devil bother? All right, I have a theory, and I'm very, I I really have a a healthy respect and fear of the Lord, so I'm very careful to say if something is my opinion, I can share my opinion. I don't know if it's true or not, but my thought is, like, why did did the devil kind of go along with this, right? I understand why Jesus did it. My theory, and I don't know if it's true, maybe one day when I go to heaven, God will tell me if I'm right or wrong. I believe that Satan thought, and you notice I'm moving those two words around. Devil means adversary. Satan, uh, there's different words for him, but it's the same person, right, this fallen angel. Um, I believe that his, in his mindset he thought, because he always tries to thwart God's plans, usurp them. So maybe he thought, well, God the Son, I've always known him in in the heavens. Now he's taken this form of a man. He's in a weakened state. Maybe I could get him to do what I want or just trip up once and totally throw off this plan of God. So that's my opinion. Don't know if it's true. One day we'll see if it is or it isn't, or God will say, I have more important things to show you. Don't worry about it. (laughs) So um, let's go with why we fast and then why Jesus fasted, right? So we fast. What's fasting? And in a nutshell, and I'll just make this kind of short, it's to attenuate the physical, tamp it down, and accentuate the spiritual. So if you, you're praying about something, you're agonizing about something, there's a big decision in life you have to make, uh, you're, you're wrestling with a, a sin issue that's plaguing you, you might go and you might fast, right? You might seek the things of God, denying your flesh for a time. And you have to be careful, you know, people have medical conditions and stuff, so um, some people, they can't fast, all right? But Jesus, again, walked a mile in our shoes, walked, his, walked probably thousands of miles in our shoes, but Jesus fasted because he was at his weakest, he was tempted, he still prevailed, and he's an example to us. And again, we're, we see a lot of this in, this in this gospel of Luke, is that Jesus identifying with us. To me, that's powerful. When you think about the word, when you identify with somebody, it's even more powerful than empathize or sympathize because Jesus actually became like us to identify with us, right? To show us the way. Verse two through four, we'll go through the first uh, temptation. So being tempted for 40 days by the devil, we we don't know what actually happened in those 40 days. We know he was fasting. There might have been some smaller skirmishes, but um, what we need to know is is in the scripture. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, since you are, or if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. You know, but Jesus answered saying, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And you could see how that might be tempting. I mean, did Satan pick up a big stone and kind of make it look like it was a nice piece of bread that came out of the semolina, that came out of the oven, and you can have that, I don't know, I don't know. But, you know, he he has power too, and, and he said, just take a bite. There's nothing sinful about doing this. 
So two out of three is the stones to bread temptation. And really what he's saying to Jesus is God doesn't care about your needs. Remember, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Son has a mission. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are still there. But the temptation is basically God doesn't care about your needs. Now, the devil used the same deception with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is important because words are powerful. There was a perceived deficit, right? When he comes to our federal head parents that were created a long time ago, Satan comes and he tempts them, and he gives them a perceived deficit. Do you think Adam and Eve really had any wants, needs, or desires in the garden? No. But Satan got into their head because that's what he does. So, you know, God's holding out on you. You know, try this, this fruit, and I mean, why would it be here? Just take a bite, right? And, and that's when everything happens. So there's this perceived deficit. Uh, he also says this to us. God will not answer or help you, but I will, you know? And we can, listen, we're uh, body, mind, and spirit. And sometimes we can be tempted as human beings. And the cool thing, we just read it in Hebrews, that Jesus was tempted like we are, except without sin. He showed us the way. So Satan is, you know, he's just a great guy. And you can see this in the world, that one squirrely friend that is always kind of taking the shortcuts and trying to get you to follow them. And we've all had them in life. And every time you go down that path, it gets you jammed up. It gets you in trouble. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I'm just thinking back. So <laughs> and I know why my parents, when I was younger, said, I don't want you hanging out with that kid, you know. And they were looking out for me, right, and whatever. In the demonic realm, they'll find out what, you're, what you think or what you're lacking, and they'll use it against you and make it seem that God doesn't care about you. By the time Adam and Eve figured it out, because they did, they figured it out that they were being played, it was too late. And folks, that can happen with us too. We sit in a pile of ashes and, say, and you almost reflect and say, where did I go wrong? I was played. I'm here. I should have just trusted God. I should have been a little bit more patient. I should have devoted more time to prayer. And, and I've been there, right? We've all been there at some point. But this is important because where Adam failed, Jesus prevailed. Amen? So the devil says to Jesus, take care of your own needs. But this would have you know, Jesus was just so, he's perfect. He's God the Son. And he never used his powers to just take care of himself. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure Jesus walked a lot. He, he napped at times. Um, he, but he didn't use his powers to take care of himself. He used his powers to help other people and to, uh, to do other things. To us, again, the temptation may be take care of yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. Uh, you got to look out for number one, all the cliches, right? And again, we, we sometimes get in trouble when we think maybe we're owed something. We have a whole culture that's being taught. Culture, I mean, older, younger, it doesn't matter, that we're owed something. And then when we go down that rabbit hole, then we have that attitude towards God. Well, God owes me something. It always gets us in trouble all the time. Jesus responds to the temptation with Scripture. Deuteronomy 8.3, 8, it is written, man... Mankind, men and women, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And this is important because this is the spiritual weapon with which we fight the spiritual battles. And churches that don't teach God's word leave their followers defenseless in spiritual battle. And that's a problem. That is a huge problem. You know, when we're tempted, we need to recall Scripture. We need to be around other believers that can unlike that squirrely friend, other believers that could lift us up where we can bear our soul to and they can kind of show us we're in the middle of the storm. We're going all over the place, but they're not in our storm and they can help balance us. They can help us to maybe recall certain scriptures that we're just in a panic and we're not remembering them. So this is, this is amazing stuff. We also have to combat these temptations with God's words, but we must know God's word first. Any important facet of life, there's scripture that covers it. And I've met people that maybe come to a church like ours or a Bible-believing church, and they, they maybe been, were in a church for 10 years, and like now they're hungry. They're like, wow, I've never... And that was me when I got saved. I'm like, I go to this church, and I'm like, I'm like so glued to what the pastor is saying because I wasn't taught this in the church that I went to. 
right? So you, you go into the battlefield and you take weapons. You go into the spiritual battlefield, you also need weapons, especially defensive weapons. And when we're not taught the scripture, we go into the battlefield with nothing. And that doesn't work out too well. So the truth is, here's, <laughs> here's a hard truth, sometimes we have to deny ourselves, right? God does care for us, but the spiritual is more important than the physical. God the Son didn't get tempted all that time and get upset because at the end there wasn't a buffet table. You know what I'm saying? He didn't say, oh, I feel like I was cheated. He knew he was there for a purpose, and he did it for us. So pretty neat. Uh, you can look at giving up the comfort of the air conditioning in the summer to go out and help the, a poor person on the street. I mean, there's plenty of people, Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. And he didn't say it casually, but because of the hard-heartedness of the human race, poverty's not going to be eradicated on this side. But when the Lord comes, he will. So there's always an opportunity. I know Christians who never go out of their comfort zones or their pleasure centers in order to serve God or to help others. And their attitude is that anything they do volunteer-wise must be convenient. Otherwise, it's a burden. That's a bad attitude, a really bad attitude. Sometimes we have to sacrifice our needs, our schedule, our comfort zones, because God is calling us for something greater. And i got to tell you, I've had this conversation in counseling with people who are very self-focused. I'm like, you need to go out and con be concerned for somebody else. Ask other people how they're doing. Do for others. We get crazy when we're self-focused, literally. I mean, I've been there just constantly focusing on yourself. It will make you depressed. And sometimes, and we, we do these outreaches, a person will come for the first time and do one of these outreaches, and they just, they're there with us for a few hours. They forget about all their problems. And they're so excited because they were able to do something for somebody else. So there's the answer to that temptation, right? Jesus didn't die, did he? God didn't let him go and, and you know, and perish and not be able to die for our sins. He didn't die in that temptation. He lived. So the devil's pushing and, and prodding and temptation was not true. I want to read something to you. We're talking about having uh, sort of spiritual weapons. 1 Corinthians 10. I really love this scripture because I call this the escape hatch uh, scripture, the way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you, me, except such that is common to man. These are common temptations. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it, to bear the temptation. I call that the escape hatch scripture. You know, there's a temptation, you're in a situation, it's like God always provides some escape hatch um, Friend, you, friend calls you, you know, you're planning something you shouldn't be planning, and friend calls you, you know, and you, you don't know that these sort of ways out are provided, and God sends them to us, right? Um, it's kind of like the joke about, you know, the guy who's in a terrible flood, and, you know, he's, you know, the people are saying to him, you got to save yourself, we'll, we'll help you, and, and they, they, they come up with like a rowboat, and, you know, the the water's up to the first floor, and the guy's like, no, 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 I'm praying the Lord's going to, he's going to do something, and now he's um, on the second floor, and the water keeps rising, and somebody else comes with a motorboat, and they're like, hey, you know, jump in, you know, we'll, we'll take you to safety. No, no, I'm praying to God, he's going to, he's going to save me, and then the guy's on the pinnacle of the roof, and there's a helicopter throwing the ladder down, he's like, no, no, I got this, you know, God's going to save me, and the guy dies and goes to heaven and says to God, where were you? He goes, I sent two boats and a helicopter, you know, <laughs> so you just didn't take it, right? So there are ways to get out of a temptation, get out of a, a trial. Um, God will provide those things. And I have to say that I'll speak personally that whenever I've sinned in my life, even as a pastor, there was always a way out and I just didn't take it. I'm not going to blame God. It's on me, right? So listen, this is important is that our, our relationship with God. Jesus, a lot of things he did on the earth was to show us by example. So if he's out in the desert and uh, it's him and it's Satan and a bunch of stones and there's nobody else, 
Why is this in here? Because Jesus wanted to make sure that his followers put it in here so it could encourage us. So the angels saw it, God saw it, the fallen angels, they see it, everyone but humans. But it's in here for our benefit. A lot of good stuff here. Um, I also say that even with, I used to have terrible like anxiety and panic attacks and um, probably 95% of the things that I was worried about or thought was going to happen never happened. I look back. So now I've, it's, it's kind of a, a learning curve. It's taken a while, but <laughs> you know, I've just learned over the years how to, like I just had a recent, you know, this test and a bone scan and it could be this and it could be that. And my wife was like, are you worried? I'm like, not at all. I, whatever happens, the Lord will cover it. He'll show me the next step to take. So I don't, you know, it's, 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 it's totally, it kind of came a long way, but I really had to trust the words that I'm reading on this page. You know, we can read the Bible for years. We could know the Bible inside and out, but we may not apply it and live the Bible. And that's really the most important part. That's why God put it here, so that we can apply it to our lives. You know, this, they call it a journey for a reason. Uh, 1 John 2, 15. Let's we'll just jump to that, and then we'll go into the second temptation. So 1 John 2, 15. Another powerful scripture. He says, do not love the world. Now, this can be translated in context, the world system that's posed against God. So just so you know that, because John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. It's a different application. God loves the people in the world. But we're not to love the world system that's poised against God. And we, a lot of things in the world in geopolitics we see is the world system poised against God. They've totally uh, discarded him. But do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world is passing away. There's our hope. You know, some people may say... And it's not just, listen, my food bills are going up. My home heating bills are going up. I, there's no magical gas station that I, I get a dollar a gallon. I, I'm suffering the way you're suffering. And people say, well, how can you be so upbeat? Because I know that this world is passing away. Christ told us, even in, during the communion uh, rite, he told his followers about coming again in the kingdom and, and it's going to be great. So I'm laying, I'm laying hold of that hope. I'm living that hope. <laughs> so this world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So this first temptation is the lust of the flesh, giving into our fleshly desires, comfort, pleasure, the dopamine rush in the brain, all that stuff. Um, I could even think about and again, these are just examples. Like we, we do this all the time. Um, if when we do the Thanksgiving outreach and we're feeding 40, 50 people, and man, you can smell that turkey, you know, and it's you know you're serving people and the, the mashed potatoes and your stomach is saying, "Feed me, you idiot," and I'm like, "Shut up, I'm feeding." So you're having a, a little bit of a war with yourself because your flesh is saying, "Take care of us." And you're saying, listen, you're, you're not going to die. When we're done with them, we'll go and, and I will feed you. So it's this, the flesh, it's the, the body part of us that, you know, uh, when, when I don't get sleep, I get cranky. It's my flesh. I want to take a nap. You know, I didn't get enough sleep last night. These are all the things of the flesh. Now, the body has to survive, right, to live in this world, but sometimes it tries to dictate things to us that we may not be ready to do, right? What about even in your, your flesh and your mind and, you know, somebody uh, is very rude on the road and almost causes an accident and you start to feel the adrenaline. That's also flesh because it's self-preservation. I can't believe that idiot did that. I am so mad I'm going to, don't do it. <laughs> just let it go. You know what I do? I just pull over. I'm being tailgated and I just say to myself, you are more important than me. You go ahead of me. You know what I'm saying? This, this would be weird if somebody got it on video where I got into a fist fight. Oh, look, Pastor Joe did this on Half Acre Road, you know? It's not going to go over that well. So, you know, you just, you got to control your flesh, you, right? Okay, let's continue. 
Um, another cliche, and we, we talked about this in the men's group last week, and then it, it showed up on Sunday, so I'm going to cover it. Uh, some say, I'm my own worst enemy. And sometimes that's true. Because check this out, right? People want it. Was it Flip Wilson? Uh, the devil made me do it. Some of the, right? The devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything. He can provide the temptation. He could make it look very pal palatable. He can put thoughts in your head, and he can just lay it out there, but he can't grab your hand. He can't grab you and make you do it. James tells us that, that being tempted is not sinful, but it's when our fleshly desires now mate with that temptation, and there's a love connection, a bad love connection. Right? But we have to, with an act of our will, our emotions and intellect, we have to actually take that step and partake of that temptation. Before that happens, being tempted is not sinful. It's not on you. It's, it's happening outside of you. But the devil didn't make us do it. You know, it's our own flesh that makes that decision to not take that escape hatch in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13. So there's a lot to this. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, you can read that on your own, says that the problems, the temptations, the trials come from three places. Well, the devil and the world system and the flesh and the flesh. So I'll just leave you with this one example. Um, you know, just too, we, we have a culture too that we, it's just blame shifting. Like we're never wrong, we're never at fault. You know, your self-esteem is so important. And there's some truth to that, but it, it's, it's out of control. So whatever we do, you know, something with our parents, something with the police, something with, it's always somebody else's fault. So I'll give you a humorous example. So there's somebody in this church, I did get permission to share this, and um, we, we go to the same gym. So he's like, hey, can you, uh, yeah, do this exercise, let's do this, let's move to that. And I'm like, you need to, you haven't done this in a long time, you need to lighten up on those weights because you're going to be in a lot of pain tomorrow and... I've been blamed for a lot of things, and I don't need to be blamed for that. So he didn't listen. So the next morning, I get a text at 11 a.m. says, I'm really, really sore. It's all your fault. <laughs> now, he was kidding, thankfully. I'm like, so we just, we just kind of have a joke about that. All right, moving on. has nothing to do with the text. Verse 5, <laughs> it says, let's go back to Luke. A lot of uh, application here says, then the devil, second one, second temptation that we're aware of, taking him up, Jesus, on a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment, right? Babylonia and Persia and, you know, the Roman Empire. And he sees at that first century and, I don't know, maybe some that didn't come yet. Not sure how he did this. Uh, and it says, the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Okay? So three out of three this morning, um, the temptation of the kingdoms of the world. Now, did Satan have the authority to do this? In a fallen state, yes. I like to say that when God created everything and then he created human beings that, you know, they opened their eyes and they saw all this beauty, the animal kingdom, uh, lush greenery, uh, just gorgeous weather all the time. And I like to say that it was God's wedding gift to our first parents. Just me, just my conjecture. Could be right, could be wrong. However, when sin entered the world, um, the human race forfeited it, and the devil was the one who tricked them. They fell into the trick, so they sort of forfeited it to him, right? It's a fallen creation. Um, it doesn't look like it did when God created it. So he did, Satan did have, to some extent, the authority and ability to give these kingdoms of the world. He did have the ability uh, he does have the ability also to circumvent things of God in our lives if we permit it. If we permit it, we can say no. Now, what is the root of this temptation? Now, in counseling, we often look at root causes of thoughts and behaviors, the dysfunctional ones especially. Um, you can see the root being God's taking too long. Now, for us, 
And, you know, you ever, hear, you ever hear Jesus take the wheel? I think they made a song about it, a book about it. Jesus take the wheel. Now that's a cliche. But this temptation is to Jesus take the wheel. The attitude is, Jesus, you're not driving fast enough. Move over. I'll take the wheel. So it's subtle, but you can see you're still in the car with him. But now you're in the driver's seat because you feel that God's going too slow. So for Jesus, right, let's go to Jesus, then let's go to us. For Jesus, take the shortcut to Messiahship. All the Old Testament uh, scriptures about the coming kingdom and, uh, you know, the animals lying down with each other and kids playing by the cobra hole and not being heard and, uh, you know, no more war. So we, we know that from the Old Testament that the Messiah would take authority over this beautiful coming kingdom. But the question is, right, Satan knows this. Well, how, I could make it happen a little bit faster for you. You know what I'm saying? Why take the circuitous route? Why suffer on the cross? After all, you are the Son of God. Two problems with that. Number one, if Jesus didn't go to the cross, we right now would all be in a lot of trouble because our sins wouldn't be paid for. That's number one. And number two, if Jesus did that, what would he get? He would get the marred version of creation the substandard, the knockoff brand, <laughs> right, version of creation. Why would he want that? Um, the crummy version. We have a whole culture, and sadly, in, in some ways in, in cultural Christianity, that we want the fast food, drive through Amazon, next day delivery version of blessings, don't we? Because this is what we're ingrained em with um, in our culture. Personally, I don't like to pay for shipping, so I'll wait a week for the product. You know what I'm saying? I'm not paying the six, seven dollars for shipping. That's just me. I'm a cheapskate, so I save money that way, and it benefits me, doesn't it? Uh, but we want to make sure that we get the the good version, right? And for Jesus, this was a plan. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was that Jesus go to the cross to redeem us spiritually, and later redeem the new creation. That's the order. The physical creation. So, again, for us, you got to get what you can in this world. That's kind of the, the attitude, the mantra. How about this? Don't let anyone get ahead of you. Life is short. You know, I remember when, they, when the supply chain issues kind of started, and you see, it's so sad, human nature. You know, probably know where I'm going. You see the videos of uh, a, a, a big store and people fighting for, the, like, the last roll of toilet paper or the last uh, chicken cutlets or it's like oh man literally getting into fist fights in the store me mine I have to you know um, but this is this is the world we live in when there's pain when there's um, suffering it some for some it brings out the best in them for others it brings out the worst in them so Jesus response was from Deuteronomy 6 and 10 uh, and basically, you, you should only worship the Lord your God. Him only shall you serve. So he fights this temptation with Scripture. Right? This is what he does. Satan, you're a distraction. You're in the way. Get out of the way. It's me and God. And that has to be for us too. What does Satan put in our path that looks tempting? Right? The, the mousetrap. What kind of piece of cheese or whatever is he trying to put in our lives this week? And we think, wow, on the, on the surface, it looks really good. Maybe this is, this is it. Maybe this is my moment. Are we praying about it? Is it a trap? Have we looked at all the angles uh, of it? Right? So there's, there's a lot to this. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Don't run ahead of the Lord. Now, of course, there are some caveats. Uh, if you're a firefighter and you have your fire truck and you're the first one on the scene and you hook up the hose to the hydrant and the water's coming through and the house is on fire, you don't sit there and go, hey, I'm going to go sit in the truck, guys, and I'm just going to pray. No, take the hose and put the fire out. You know what I'm saying? Um, I remember for me when I was a police officer, I would, my praying would be on the way to work before it started. You know, And I would be, all right, Lord, um, I would pray for safety. I'd pray for good judgment. I would pray to not falsely accuse anybody. You know, these were my prayers in the car on the way to work. And you know what? I feel that God was with me in my career. Um, I, don't, I don't look back and have any regrets. So, so that's where, I mean, we should, when we wake up in the morning, that's a great time to pray. You know, I do a lot of my praying in my car because I drive a lot. 
and there's nobody else around me to distract me. So I'll just, and it's great. With the Bluetooth, people don't think you're crazy. They don't think you're talking to yourself. They think you're on the Bluetooth. I'm just, I'm God's Bluetooth, you know what I'm saying? All right, moving on. Uh, <laughs> Jesus didn't take shortcuts, neither should we. In John 2, right, what we, what we read, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, what would this be? This would be the lust of the eyes. Now, this is important because we have a, a whole culture that's uh, ocular-oriented. You know, it's everything. You, could you imagine how many bits of information every day pass from the eyeball via the optic nerve into the brain? You wonder why when we sleep, we dream, and we, you know, we need an X amount. I mean, the brain is bombarded with information. And now, right, with the computer age and the phones and social media, it's, it's an assault on our minds. It really is. So we are bombarded um, with images that can tend to make us impulsive. Did you know that advertising is a multi-billion dollar industry? And I might be shortening a little bit. It might be even worth more than that. You know, you, you see uh, big corporations in social media, they actually hire not only advertisers, this is messed up, they hire psychologists because they want you to look at something and be immediately drawn into it and purchase it so they can get rich. Isn't that messed up? But that's the culture we live in. Sometimes we have to give our eyes a rest from all the garbage that we see on a regular basis. We need to put our time into prayer, into reading scripture because we're just assaulted with a, a, a preponderance, a large amount of, of these images. I'll, I'll just leave you with this. How many of you have heard about the study in social media with Instagram with teen girls, right? And the study, it was, a, it was a very valid study, it came out in a lot of um, news media, that teen girls are, are becoming more suicidal, and some of them are taking their lives. I just heard somebody, as I came into this church, play, pray for so-and-so, because they have an 18-year-old daughter who's in the hospital who tried to take their life for body image, right? Um, because these young girls, they're not, they haven't even, their brains haven't even formed completely yet, neither do the guys, but they're bombarded with these body image uh, things in Instagram and social media, and it's causing a wave of depression. Parents, guard your kids, you know? What are they looking at? They're gonna need your help. You've gotta rescue them. And I tell you, it's, it's tough. It's not an easy thing. You know, because then they, they start to resent you and think you're overbearing and they're trying to assert their independence. But we are assaulted every day with images. It makes us impulsive. It makes us depressed. It makes us confused about a lot of things. Amen? Amen. Okay. Tempted in the wilderness. We're going to cover part two next Sunday. Christ suffered in this scenario in order to better prepare us for what we face today. This was written 2,000 years ago, but like, wait till I get to the next one next Sunday, and you kind of put them all together. This is powerful. This encompasses every facet of our lives, folks. So that's why they call it the living word, because, you know, you can read books that were written 50 years ago in that culture, and you're like, yeah, it doesn't have any effect today. This book is God's word. So everything in here, the applications that we make are good for all the way up to 2022 and beyond if the Lord should tarry. But he's, he's given us this so we can better prepare. He gave us spiritual weapons to fight spiritual battles. The world, the flesh, and the devil have equal parts in doing things to keep us from the living God. But I often say that, and it's true, and I'll just speak for myself, if I get to a place, a, a time period, and I just kind of say to myself, you know, I feel like God is distant. God is always in the same place. He's consistent. If God is distant, it's because we move, not him. This is designed to get us back closer to him so that we can continue that sweet fellowship regardless if Rome is burning around us. So the world, flesh, and the devil have equal parts in driving us further from the living God, but Jesus showed us how to combat these things to keep us close to God and go the distance as spiritual beings in the decadent world. And you know what? That applies to 2022. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are so awesome. I, I, no matter what book I read, I'm like, wow, there's just so many applications here. It's just so powerful, Lord. We just love your word. There's so much truth to it. There's so much hope. There's so much love. 
And I just would pray while we're uh, bowing our heads and the worship team is going to lead us in worship, that if there's anybody here this morning and you're moved, it isn't because I have great oratory skills. I'm just like you. It's because I'm using good material. I'm using a good playbook. So I just would encourage you at this moment, if you'd like to come up to receive Christ, you know, I mean, it's one thing. I grew up in religion too, but admittedly, I, I wasn't close to God. I didn't have a relationship. So I want to encourage anybody right now who's physically here to just come up out of their seat, come to the front. I'll just lead you in a, a short prayer. And it's not about the prayer. It's not about this church. There's no, you don't have to commit to anything here. It's between you and the Lord. We're just facilitators. We're just beggars showing another beggar where to find bread, free bread. So you come if that's your desire. I got to say that many a times I recounted my own experience and then the person that either that day or the next Sunday came up and I said I remember when it was me I still remember almost 30 years ago that I had just had this uncomfortableness <laughs> sitting where you are um, I didn't know Christ and the altar call came up and I was like so uncomfortable and I had so many thoughts running through my head and I'm like, I really want to go up, but I had all these ridiculous reasons why I stayed seated. Eventually, I came forward. If you're wrestling with some of those thoughts, God is, he's, he is tugging at your heartstrings, but God is a gentleman. He's not going to force you to do anything. It's got to be your choice. So I just want, before we partake of communion, is there anybody right now who'd like to come up and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior? We'll wait. If you still have questions, Definitely see me, uh, talk to somebody about what it means, and you should get your questions asked. It is a tremendous life decision, but it's one that nobody regrets. We regret a lot of things in life. This is not one of those things. So um, at this time, 